morning, church family. My name is Caitlin, and I am one of the pastors here at First Methodist. For the past four and a half years, I haven't spent much time with you all. I have been on the sixth floor with our source community and have also made the move west with our source community. But I'm happy to share with you that I'm stepping or transitioning to a little bit of a different role where I'll be working on spiritual formation and things that help us grow and discipleship. So I will have the opportunity to be with all of our worshiping communities. And I'm really excited about that, um, both to be with all of you, but also because I love nerding out on the things that help us grow. So I look forward to spending more time with you in the days ahead. To start us off this morning, I want to begin with a question. If I said to you, this is a Kodak moment, what does that mean? You can participate with me. A picture. Yes, it means that I'm saying this is a special moment and that we need to capture it with a picture. George Eastman, the man who invented what we now know of as amateur photography, went on a family vacation in the 1870s, and at that time, cameras were about the size of a microwave. Very heavy, very difficult to maneuver on your picnics and other family outings. And so he had this idea. He said, I want to make the camera as convenient to use as the pencil. And boy, did he do that. So long story short, up for the next 120 years, he put together this company, and they invented several pieces of technology and kept developing the camera so that now absolutely anyone can use a camera. He accomplished his goal of making photography as easy to use as a pencil. And in the 90s, they were one of five extremely, one of the most valuable brands in all of the world. People knew what Kodak was, what they did, and what they were successful at giving to the world. And then, what happened in the early 2000s that paused, that gave them some troubles? Does anyone know? Right before the cell phone, cameras went digital, yes. And so we have here this company whose mission was to make cameras as easy to use as the pencil. But what ended up happening is they missed that opportunity to pivot, so much so that in 2012, they declared bankruptcy. And so this company that was once iconic for all of the country became irrelevant because they failed to pivot when the technology around them changed. I think that what happened in the midst of this, and you can read business analysts and you can read historians to describe what they think exactly happened, but I think it's quite simple. I think they forgot what their mission was. They had gotten so into film and getting people to print their pictures that they had forgotten that their mission wasn't film, their mission was making photography accessible. And I can't help but wonder if they had remembered with clarity what their goal really was, if Kodak might still be as relevant today as it was 50 years ago. I think clarity around the goal matters greatly, and there is a lot at stake. I think that Paul would agree that the clarity of goal is absolutely essential. So what we're going to do this morning is we're going to look at these verses, verse by verse, um, and we're going to see what does Paul have in store for us, or what can we learn from this letter that Paul wrote to the church at Philippi so long ago. Our first verse is 12. And the first part of verse 12 says that, not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal. So we have Paul admitting to us that he has not reached the goal. Now, so as I was reflecting on this scripture this week, this caused me some pause because Paul, this is the same Paul who is an apostle. He is literally spending his life traveling around to different churches in order to plant them and encourage them and build them up. He's now even put his body on the line and he is imprisoned and he still has not given up the call. He's now writing letters because he can't physically get to all of these churches. 
This same Paul says to us that he has not yet reached the goal. So when I was reading this, I was thinking, oh, Lord in heaven, I'm gonna need some help because if Paul hasn't reached the goal, I am nowhere near as close as Paul is. But I think Paul is getting at something deeper here. See, I think Paul is pointing out that life of faith is a process. So I think for Paul, you never reach the goal until you are unified with Christ in heaven after life here on earth. So for Paul, no matter where you're at in the process, we have not reached the goal until we are one with Christ in the afterlife. Paul, I think this is one of Paul's major themes, and I hope that if you've been with us the past few weeks, that you've been able to see that. In chapter one, verse six, Paul says, the same God who began these good works in you is going to continue them on. He's emphasizing that God is working out a process in each of us and in all of us collectively. And then last week in chapter two, we saw Paul tell the church to say, he says, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Keep giving it effort. Don't stop, keep pressing forward. Again, Paul is saying this is a process. This isn't a one-time moment thing. This is something that you continue on in. And we see this emphasis of process again in chapter three today, where he compares this pursuing of the goal to a race, a runner running in a race. For Paul, in his theology, it is essential that we understand that he believes our faith is a process of growth. Recently, I have been nerding out on developmental psychology, and I just go wherever my curiosity takes me, and I found this man named Richard Fowler. Are any of you familiar with him? Oh good, you're gonna get to learn something today, except for you, Chris. But he is such an interesting person because he was trained as a theologian first, and then he got into developmental psychology and ended up developing what psychologists today call the stages of faith, an iconic work. And I love the way that he marries this deep understanding of theology and the Christian story and the narrative and the way that it's meant to shape us. And he then does his research and he interviewed thousands of people in order to develop clarity around what was true in each of the stages of faith. According to Fowler, there are six stages. I'm not going to talk much about stages one, two, and three, because our children and our elementary students and our adolescents are probably in other spaces learning at developmentally appropriate levels, which is wonderful. But so for you, we're going to talk about, I wanna talk about stages four, five, and six. And this is so good and it pairs so well with what I think Paul is getting at when he talks about process. One of the reasons I love studying psychology is that God is the one who created us. So as we grow in our understanding of how the human mind works, it only helps us understand our creator more. I think God has designed us for this process. In stage four, which happens for most people or begins in uh, early adulthood, stage four is where you really focus on what is it that you believe? What is deeply true for you? You spend time thinking about what my boundaries are, what do I think is in and out, what do I think is true and false. You begin to have clarity around what you believe versus the family that you grew up in. There's a process of differentiation that happens there. This is a good stage, but this stage is not where we're meant to stay. And what I found so both uh, encouraging and challenging and heartbreaking at the same time as I was reading his research, is that this is the stage where the vast majority, and and this happened in America, his study, this is where the vast majority of American Christians and people in general stay. Most people stay in stage four their entire lives. We spend most of our time thinking about our boundaries and what we believe is true and false, and this stage tends to emphasize logical thinking over other forms of knowing. It's a very thinking-oriented stage. Now, once again, this is not a bad stage. We cannot skip stages. His theory very clearly shows us that you must be where you're at and then continue forward. 
So it's not a bad stage. This is, in fact, healthy. If you try to skip the boundary-setting stage, you become dysfunctional later in life in relationships. It's healthy to start here. But we miss out on so much if this is where we stay. And I think that we can see this in both scripture and if we look further at Fowler's theory. Because do you know what comes with five, the conjunctive faith? What comes with this stage is an increased capacity for vulnerability, for the ability to sit in what is difficult and confusing. The reason that most people do not go into the stage prior to midlife is that usually it takes some type of loss or struggle or failure or pain to propel you towards this stage. That doesn't mean it can't happen for you before midlife, but for most people, midlife is where this is capable of emerging. But what comes out of this, this wrestling with difficulty and doubt, is this greater capacity for trust in the one in whom your faith is to begin with. What else comes from this stage is this is usually where people are really in a, a healthy and capable place to be able to engage with people who are different from them. This is also the stage where people move from a belief about justice, which means what you believe is right in the world. You move from a concern of what is just and right for your tribe and your people and your family to this belief in what I believe is right for my tribe means my God is a universal God, and so this must be right for all people, that if, if I believe that justice for my family must take shape in this way, then everyone is worthy of that same justice. And so this stage, people in this stage usually have this fount of wisdom that others are attracted to. They usually have this quality of peace that is unexplainable. They are usually the people that others will seek for wisdom because even in the midst of what is difficult and confusing, they're able to hold tightly to faith and not shy away from questions. This is a stage of paradox and fruitfulness. Very few people in America move through to this stage, and even fewer people, according to his research, make it to stage six. And just for clarity, in six, it's called the universalizing faith. This does not mean he's saying you become a universalist. What he means here is that, I know, I've gotten some questions, not preaching that this morning, but what it means is that you move towards this universalizing view of love and compassion, that your love and compassion is no longer limited, and you instead see it as available, and that your job is to now offer that to everyone. This is the stage where people love life, but hold it loosely at the same time. I think we see this in Paul. I think we see his tension of, if I'm here, then I still have ministry to do, and that is good. And yet, I'm ready to go be with Jesus tomorrow if he calls me home. It is how you hold these two things together. I also think that we can see the example of Jesus being in stage six, because this same, this same Jesus who offered himself to us this one that we are attempting to emulate and become like, spent his life on behalf of others. And one of the hallmarks of this sixth stage is that in instead of spending time wondering, what should I do? How can my identity be formed? How can I add to my own life? It becomes about spending your resources and all the things you've learned on behalf of others, on behalf of the world. The reason I find this so helpful and so profound is because I think it maps out for us in some very practical ways this process of faith that all of Scripture is pointing to. I think that when Paul says, I've not yet reached it, and I'm doing all these things, he's indicating to us in the church, keep stepping forward. There's more to this process. There are more riches to knowing Christ than you could ever fathom We've never arrived this side of heaven, which is both encouragement and challenge. It's encouragement because if you find yourself struggling, if you find yourself over and over again making the same mistakes and just really be finding that wrestle difficult, the encouragement keeps stepping forward. You're in process. It's okay to not have it all figured out today. And it's challenge. It is challenge to those of us who maybe have been in a very similar place in our faith for the past several years. 
This word is challenge for us that we don't get complacent, that we never think that we arrived. One of my favorite authors who is um, responsible for the iconic work the, about spiritual disciplines, Richard Foster says, we are always beginners. We are never experts in spiritual formation and spiritual disciplines. There is always more to learn and experience in the riches of relationship with Christ. Now, I could spend the whole rest of my morning talking about the stages of faith, but Andy has encouraged me to let him out by the, the kickoff time. So you, well, you're welcome, all of you who are rushing out to watch the football game after this, or whatever your team is. Um, but I really could, so if you want me to share this book with you and you would like to meet with coffee to talk through some of this later, I would be more than happy to. I'm also happy to share my sermon notes. Several people from 845 asked for a copy and I would be happy to share those with you as well because there's so much more to learn here than we have time to get in this morning. Next, Paul moves on to verse 13. Oh, nope, he finishes verse 12 first. He says, I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. This is an important part of his stepping towards the goal because he owns that he is responsible for this goal. Now, this is one of those paradox things in Paul, and I think it's really dangerous to read Paul and pull one verse and say this is true for all of Paul, because Paul often holds things together. And I think we see an example of this here. Because Paul, in verse six of chapter one, says God's gonna be the one who works it out. God is the one who's completely responsible. And then he says in chapter two, I need you to continue to struggle to work out your salvation. Paul, is it God's responsibility or is it my responsibility? And I think Paul would say yes. Paul would say it is God's responsibility and it's your responsibility. And we don't need to spend time arguing about which one it is. I think we can see evidence that taking ownership of the process is a healthy part of growing in faith. I also think that's important in the life of our church. And one of the things that I wonder how our over-professionalizing of the role of pastor has really hurt us in the long run. I'm not saying that training isn't helpful. I really could have used twice as much training as I got before becoming a pastor, so I think training is helpful. But I do think that something happened when we shifted and said just these few, only these few people are really responsible for most of the work of the church. I think we ended up cutting off a whole bunch of really phenomenal gifts that are meant to be a part of all of the life of the church. Paul's extremely clear, we see in 1 Corinthians 12, every single follower of Jesus has a role to own in the body of Christ has a part to play, every single one of us. And sometimes I think we overemphasize those that get sent away to seminary, but I wanna tell you this morning, every single one of you has been entrusted with a role in the life of this community, in this body of Christ. And when even just one part doesn't take their role seriously, the whole body can be hurt as a result. And so my encouragement to you is to really ask and take that question seriously this morning. What is the part that God has entrusted you with? What is the part that is waiting to be done because you've hesitated? My encouragement would be to say, step forward. And I think that that's exactly where Paul takes us next. He says, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. Paul literally then says, but move forward, continue to move forward. And he is here is using this race imagery. Now, what happens if you're running, I'm not going to run on the stage, it would end badly, but you turn around. What would happen or what could happen? You fall off, as I have almost done several times up here before. I started preaching in flats to avoid that. But if you're not looking where you're going, <laughs> you're gonna end falling or in the wrong place or you're going to get hurt in the process. Paul is saying, keep your eyes forward on the goal, right? You end up where your eyes are focusing. I think this matters tremendously in 2018 where we have a lot of choices about where to put our eyes. We have 
billions of choices of what we can put our eyes on. And if we're not intentional, what we spend our time consuming with our eyes will shape where we end up. It will shape the kind of people we become, the kind of community we are. Where we gaze shapes where we end up. And so I think Paul's really a spot on here when he says, keep your eyes moving forward. Now, I don't think that he's saying you don't remember anything. And in fact, a wise commentator pointed that out. He said, Paul's not saying you don't have memory because in fact, worship, the gathering of worship is an act of remembrance. And remembrance is a part of how we know who we are. Coming to the table, Jesus says the words, do this in remembrance of me. So I don't think Paul is saying cut off all memory. What I think he's encouraging us is to not spend so much time looking behind us that we miss where God is taking us next. He's saying don't look to the past to the exclusion of what's in the present. And this is true for regret and celebration. If we spend so much time regretting the mistakes we've made in the past, we'll miss new opportunities in the present. And if we spend too much time celebrating what God has already done, we'll miss opportunities for fruitfulness that God is calling us to here and now. I'm so honored and humbled that this is the church that I was appointed to serve right out of seminary. Hearing the stories of the preachers who have stood up here, I can't think about it too much or I'll start crying and I'll run off because it's overwhelming to me the amount of fruitful ministry that God has done in this place. I'm truly honored and humbled to even be a fraction of worthy to be able to stand in this moment. One of the stories that was told to me when I first got here and with so much joy is that this was one of the first churches to desegregate. This was one of the first churches to say, we are not going to be a church of segregation, everyone is welcome here. And I am so grateful to stand in that legacy. But if we're not careful, if we spend so much time celebrating what this church has already done, we will miss the opportunities to make as bold of decisions in the present. There are always things happening around us. That has been true every day of the church's existence. There are always moments where the church decides to close off or to love a little bit more freely, to decide, no, this is safer, or we really do want to share more of Christ with the world. And so my encouragement on this point would be to spend time thinking about where could we be as bold for the sake of love and truth in our world today as we were just a generation ago. I think there's both great encouragement there and challenge there for us. And finally, Paul ends with his unwavering clarity about the goal. Paul says, I press on towards this goal for the prize. Well, what is this goal? He's given us really clear, explicit language about what his goal is just a few verses earlier. Paul says, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participate in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death and so somehow attaining the resurrection from the dead. Paul is extremely clear that his goal is to know Christ and to share that knowledge with the world. That's it. Everything else can be taken away. That one goal is his singular focus. Remember the story of Kodak? And I, I mentioned how they lost track of what their goal really was. People have misdiagnosed what happened with Kodak. Did you know that they actually created the first digital camera? It was one of their engineers in the 70s. Came up with the technology that put them out of business. Is that not ironic? Not only did they have that tech, in early 2000, they acquired a platform, that might be the right word, not a tech person. They acquired a platform that allowed people to upload digital images into the cloud. In 2000, way before the rest of us were uploading our photos, they had billions of dollars at their resource, at, at their disposal. And yet, they still lost it all. What they did with that technology, they used the new technology 
to still try to get people to print their pictures. And they did not pay attention to the fact that the game was changing. But here's the other beautiful thing. They didn't need to change their mission. Their mission was still beneficial, beautiful, good. The mission of making photography available and accessible to everyone. Had they been aligned to their mission, they should have been the inventors of Instagram. They should have been the ones who said, how can we make this even more accessible to people? They had all the raw tools. But an internal struggle made them use a new technology to prop up the old method. We must love our mission more than our method. We must. There is so much at stake when we start to make the method of something subservient to the mission. Our mission of knowing Christ and our mission of sharing that knowledge with the world is just as profound and good today as it was 2,000 years ago. But we would be arrogant to believe that we're not capable of making the same blunder that Kodak did. And this is not the work of just the pastors. This is the work of all of us as the community. Do we love Jesus? I know that we do. Do we believe that our mission is just as relevant today as it was back then? I really believe we do. So the question is, are we willing to let go of old methods if it doesn't help us accomplish our mission? I have some questions for us that these questions are meant to be taken with you. I don't think this is the kind of challenge that we solve in a moment of worship together. I do think these are questions worth asking. And I know that this is a difficult time in culture and the world. It's, it, things are changing, they just are. Things are stepping into a new season and that can be a terrifying thing. But my hope and prayer for us is that if, as we wrestle with that, that we would be encouraged that Jesus loves the church even more than us. That Jesus loves and has a good plan in the future for all of us more extraordinary than we could imagine. And we have responsibility to pay attention to where it is that Jesus is leading us forward. These questions that I would love for you to think about are, have you taken ownership of your conversion and your calling, where God met you and where God is calling you? Have you identified where you're at in the process? Have you been stuck for a few years and maybe God is inviting you forward? Are you continually taking one step forward and do some real internal time, maybe with your family, your small group, your Sunday school class. What is the real goal you're pursuing? Sometimes the real goal we're pursuing is actually different than what we say. So I hope and pray that as we start to move forward towards 2019, that we would with fresh ears hear the ways that God is calling us forward. I hope that you pray these words to this hymn we're about to sing deeply begging God to speak with greater clarity, begging God to give you the ears to hear where it is that he's calling us. Let's pray.